Mr. Speaker, I would move that the House suspend the rules and pass the bill H.R. 5728, Stella Reauthorization Act of 2014. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 5728, the bill and the Communications Act of 1934 and Title 17, United States Code, to extend expiring provisions relating to the retransmission of signals of television broadcast stations and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, and the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, each will control 20 minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. Uh, I would ask uh, unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and insert extraneous materials into the record and on the bill. Without objection, so ordered. So, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I might consume. Gentleman is recognized. And, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to offer yet another outstanding example of bipartisanship and thoughtful policymaking from the Energy and Commerce Committee. The Stella Reauthorization Act is an important piece of legislation that ensures that millions of satellite TV subscribers continue to receive broadcast TV programming from their chosen satellite provider. We've reached across party lines and across the two houses of Congress to craft a bill for this, a compromise bill for this must pass legislation that will improve the video marketplace for TV viewers across the country. In addition to reauthorizing the distant signals offered by satellite providers, we're able to include targeted reforms that will in fact will enhance the video marketplace and allow consumers to access the programming that they want when they want it. These reforms are prime examples of the kinds of deregulatory changes that we're looking at as we work to replace the 80-year-old Communications Act. They're going to spur investment in communication networks, promote competition, and, yes, create needed American jobs. For example, the bill eliminates the costly cable card integration ban that has increased the cost of cable leased set-top boxes and makes them less energy efficient. Ultimately, this is a double whammy for consumers because after being forced to pay for an unnecessary and antiquated technology, consumers then have to pay a penalty in the form of higher electric bills. Although we eliminate, eliminated the whole mandate in our original bill that we passed uh, through our committee, we worked with our Senate colleagues and agreed to sun sunset the provision in one year. This will provide time for the FCC to hold a working group on successor solutions to cable card without unduly delaying the benefits to consumers who choose to lease equipment from their cable provider. The bill also evens the playing field for all video providers. It seeks regulatory parity for cable and satellite providers when it comes to protecting broadcast signals during Nielsen sweeps. It also provides satellite operators and broadcasters with the opportunity to modify local markets like cable oper operators already have the ability to do so. We hope that in our update of the Communications Act that we can find additional ways to eliminate regulatory differences that no longer serve a meaningful technical purpose or that distorts business and consumer incentives. The bill provides uh, other positive bipartisan reforms and it is our intent that as we update the Communications Act in the coming Congress, that it continues along that very same path. That being said, the matter before us is the reauthorization of these provisions for the millions of satellite viewer subscribers that depend on them. The clock's ticking, and the bill will ensure when folks flip on their TVs, yes, their favorite show will be available when they want to watch it. I would urge all my colleagues to vote for the bill as this Congress is quickly drawing to a close. I particularly want to thank the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology Chair Greg Walden, Ranking Members Henry Waxman and Anna Eshoo, and Judiciary Chairman Bob Goodlatte, as well as our respective staffs for their bipartisan and hard work on this very important legislation. I also want to thank our Senate colleagues uh, Jay Rockefeller and John Thune, for their willingness to work with us to find common ground. I'm proud of our committee's record of bipartisan results. And as we work toward the COMAC update next year to modernize our nation's communication laws for the innovation area, continued cooperation will be critical to that success. Without this bill, 
without this reauthorization being moving forward, satellite viewers, millions of Americans, will have those sets turned off. It's important that we reauthorize this bill, and I'm pleased to do so in a very bipartisan way, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Michigan reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of H.R. 5728, the Satellite Television Tran Extension and Localism Act reauthorization. This is a continuation of our bipartisan efforts this year to ensure that 1.5 million satellite subscribers don't lose access to the broadcast programming when the current satellite transmission law expires at the end of this year, and to make some targeted reforms to the video marketplace. The bill before us today represents a compromise with our colleagues from the Senate, and I look forward to working with them to quickly pa see it's passed into law. In July, the House passed H.R. 4572 to reauthorize the expiring communication and copyright law that allows households across America, but especially those in rural areas, in, ac in access to uh, broadcast, broadcast content. In addition, the Engine Commerce Committee, on which I serve, was able to come to an agreement on several key reforms in our video laws to benefit the TV watching public. H.R. 5728 maintains these bipartisan provisions from the bill we adopted in July, in particular addressing the abuses in the retransmission consent process. The bill prevents two non-commonly owned broadcasters from colluding to jointly negotiate for a retransmission consent. The Energy and Commerce Committee heard extensive testimony about how this practice drives up prices for consumers and potentially threatens access to local broadcast content. I also want to emphasize this language does not permit broadcast stations that are deemed commonly owned as a result of the Joint Sales Agreement Act to go say jointly for retransmission consent. Our colleagues on the Senate Commerce Committee proposed additional pro-consumer reforms, and I'm pleased that we're able to include those in H.R. 5728. These provisions include an FCC rulemaking to access the standard for determining whether parties are negotiating good faith or retransmission consent, a prohibition on broadcasters from preventing significantly viewed signals from being carried in local markets, and greater transparency for consumers by including retransmission consent payments in the FCC's report on cable rates. H.R. 5728 also makes further changes to the provision that were heavily debated in the House during consideration of H.R. 4572. The bill now extends by six months the deadline for broadcasters to unwind certain joint sales agreements, a rule which the FCC tightened earlier this year to address concerns that broadcaster coordination in local markets were undermining localism and competition and diversity. Finally, H.R. 5728 reflects further compromise on the FCC's cable set top box rules. The FCC's integration ban, a rule written to promote competition in the cable set top spot market, will sunset in one year. This well-intentioned rules has not resulted in the kind of competition Congress envisioned and has actually caused significant energy efficiencies in table set boxes. I'm pleased that we're including an idea from our Senate colleagues to create a working group that's charged with identifying a successor solution. I support further efforts to promote competition in the set-top box market and look forward to engaging with the working group in the FCC on this issue. I want to thank Chairman Upton and Chairman Walden on the, and on the Senate side, uh, Chairman Rockefeller and Ranking Member Thune, also our Ranking Members on our side of the aisle, uh, Ranking Member Waxman and Eshu and the other Democrats on our committee, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Mr. Speaker, may I ask how much time I have remained on my side? The gentleman from Michigan has 16 minutes remaining. Thank you. At this time, I would yield three minutes to the distinguished chairman of the Telecommunications Subcommittee, Mr. Walden from Oregon. The uh, gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, is recognized for three minutes. Thank the uh, chairman of the committee, and I thank uh, and Chairman, uh, Mr. Speaker, last July, the House Representative passed H.R. 4572, the Stella Reauthorization Act, by a unanimous vote. Today, after extensive consultation with our colleagues in the Senate, we're offering a second version of Stella's reauthorization, which will extend the copyright and retransmission consent provisions for distant signal retransmitted by commercial satellite providers for five years. Now, if we don't act to extend these provisions uh, by the end of this Congress, there will be a million and a half subscribers to t satellite television, including many in my home state of Oregon, that just won't have access to broadcast network programming 
come New Year's Day. This bill represents the best of how Congress can work together and get things done. Uh, today's version of Stellar is a compromise bill that incorporates the previous past un uh, provisions. Un these were passed unanimously by the House earlier this year with the provisions that passed by voice vote out of the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation. Now, by coming together to produce legislation with strong bipartisan, bicameral support, we've demonstrated our clear commitment to the continued availability of broadcast programming to millions of subscribers and to some targeted and, in some cases, much needed reforms to our communications laws. Specifically, Mr. Speaker, this bill sets a date for the sunset of the FCC's integration ban on cable leased set-top boxes. That clears the way for innovation and new investment by lifting an unnecessary regulatory burden that has cost the cable industry and its consumers a billion dollars, a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker, since 2007 it's cost. I especially want to thank Vice Chairman Bob Latta, who's right here, and my Democratic colleague from Texas, Gene Green who you just heard from, for their thoughtful bipartisan work on lifting the integration ban. Now, the bill offers a glide path for those companies that current re currently rely on cable card and urges the consumer electronics manufacturers and MVPDs to work together to find a next generation solution for a competitive set-top box market. Our bill also opens up the ability for satellite operators and broadcasters to modify local markets so that consumers can receive programming that is relevant to their communities. Broadcasters have long had the ability to reach such agreements with cable systems, and this bill creates parity, allowing broadcasters to ensure their programming is reaching the right communities via satellite, regardless of DMA boundaries. Our bill also provides parity by removing a government restriction on cable's ability to drop broadcast signals during the Nielsen sweeps. Additionally, the bill ensures that consumers will be able to access locally relevant broadcasts from outside their local markets without interference from local broadcasters. We've also sought to stabilize the retransmission consent regime. This bill prohibits broadcast stations and single markets from negotiating jointly with cable and satellite operators. The bill also seeks to allow policymakers to gather more information on retransmission consent by requiring cable operators to report annually on their payments for broadcast programming. This bill also asks the FCC to re-examine the meaning of good faith in retransmission consent negotiations, but importantly, it does not predetermine any outcomes for that rulemaking. The Stellar Reauthorization Act is yet another example of true bipartisanship with support from all sectors of the communications industry. This type of collaboration has long been the hallmark of our committee, and I'm pleased to see the legislative result before us today. As this Congress is drawing to a close quickly, I urge my colleagues to join me in getting this important legislation onto the President's desk and signed into law before the authorization ends at the end of the year. Now, it takes many hands to make light work. This bill was no different. In particular, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to commend the staff from the Commerce Committee's House Commerce staff, David Reddell, Ray Baum, Grace Coe, Sean Chang, Margaret McCarthy, and David Grossman, as well as Senate Commerce staff, Ellen Dineski, John Branscombe, Sean Bone, David Quinalti, and Hap Rigby. They spent many hours working to find common ground on this bill, Mr. Speaker, and their effort has paid off for consumers. Thank you again, and I return the balance of my time. The time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas reserves. The gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I would yield uh, two minutes uh, to the distinguished gentleman from Louisiana, the Republican whip, and a member of the uh, Committee on Energy and Commerce, uh, Mr. Scalise. Two minutes. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to thank Chairman Upton for yielding and for his leadership, as well as Chairman of the subcommittee, Walden, and the ranking members uh, for bringing a good bipartisan bill to the floor that addresses some real problems and starts to lay some groundwork for important future discussions about the video marketplace. Uh, let me first say, Mr. Speaker, that the Stellar Reauthorization Act will give certainty and ensure that a million and a half satellite customers across the country don't have to fear losing their signal at the end of this year, uh, which would happen without passage of this legislation. So it's very important that immediately we get this resolved uh, so that we don't create that uncertainty across the country. 
Uh, but also, Mr. Speaker, why this bill is important is it finally starts to implement some important and much needed reforms to our video marketplace laws. Uh, I've been saying this for a long time. If you look at the laws that we have on the books, we have a 21st century marketplace. We have a dynamic industry that has evolved and grown, and the technology has advanced in a dramatic way over the last few decades. But unfortunately, the laws have not changed to reflect the current marketplace. And we have started that conversation with a few of the provisions in this bill, and I was happy to work uh, with the chairman, the ranking member, and others on some of those provisions. And we also talked about the need to have a deeper conversation about a Communications Act update next year in the new Congress. And I look forward to helping working with my colleagues on that as well. But in the meantime, it's important that we pass this bill and that we urge the Senate to move quickly as well to create that certainty for those customers all across the country that are counting on us to get this done. And again, I congratulate uh, the chairman, ranking member, uh, for working in a bipartisan way to bring this bill to the House floor and pass it along. And I yield back the balance of my time. Time of the uh, gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Texas. We'll continue to reserve. The gentleman from Texas continues to reserve. The gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, at this point, I will yield uh, two minutes to the vice chair of the subcommittee, Mr. Latta from Ohio. The uh, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, is recognized for two minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the gentleman from Michigan, the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Upton, for yielding. I rise today in support of H.R. 5728, the Stellar Reauthorization Act of 2014. I am pleased to see the bipartisan and bicameral effort that took place to bring forth this must-pass legislation. Through the leadership of Chairman Upton and Chairman Walden, and with the bipartisan support of Ranking Me Member Waxman and Subcommittee Ranking Member Eshoo, this legislation underscores a commitment to ensuring that our communication laws maximize the potential for investment, innovation, and consumer choice. I'm especially pleased this bill incorporates a bipartisan pro-consumer provision to eliminate the current set-top box integration ban similar to the one that I, along with Congressman Jean Green, sponsored in the House. Repealing this outdated technological mandate will foster greater investment and innovation in the set-top box market. It is clear that the integration ban is simply unnecessary and does not reflect the technological advancements or consumer demands of today, which, have, which, which has been agreed upon and supported on a bipartisan level even by the Progressive Policy Institute. I urge my colleagues to vote yes and support this bipartisan legislation. And again, I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I thank the speaker, and I yield back. The gentleman from Ohio has yielded back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Texas. We'll continue to reserve, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman from Texas continues to reserve. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I would yield two minutes to the gentleman uh, uh, from the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Marino. Two minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Speaker. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, this afternoon the House will consider Joint Judiciary and Energy and Commerce Committee legislation, H.R. 5728, the Stellar Reauthorization Act of 2014, to ensure that all of our constituents continue to have access to network channels on America's two satellite carriers. Title II of the legislation extends the expiring Section 119 copyright license for another five years as this committee has done on previous occasions, most recently in 2010. This license ensures that when our constituents do not have access to a full complement of local network television stations, they can have access through satellite television carriers to distant network television stations. This helps ensure that consumers in rural areas like mine in Pennsylvania's 10th Congressional District have the same access to news and entertainment options that consumers in urban areas enjoy. Without enactment of this legislation, many of our constituents would potentially lose access to certain networks altogether on December 31st when the current license expires. I would like to point out that although numerous stakeholders interested in video issues have contacted the committee on a variety of issues, they all agree that this license should not expire at the end of this year. Other issues of interest in this area will be the subject of further discussion as my committee continues its ongoing review of our nation's copyright laws. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this bipartisan pro-consumer legislation, and I yield back. 
gentleman yields back the uh, balance of his time. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield uh, for whatever time he consumed our ranking member on Energy and Commerce Committee, Congressman Waxman. The uh, gentleman from uh, California is recognized for such, t uh, such time as he may consume. Thank you very much for yielding to me, Mr. Speaker. I'm a strong supporter of science-based policies, and throughout my career I've always welcomed expert scientific advice and relied upon facts and scientific evidence to legislate. But the bill we're considering today is not a sound science bill. It's actually an anti-science bill. It would take away the ability of decision makers to rely on published peer-reviewed studies to protect our health and our planet. This is <laughs> Mr. Uh, the Speaker, and that's why I'm opposed to the next bill. <laughs> and the gentleman from California can revise and extend his remarks. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. The, the gentleman is, uh, does the gentleman from uh, Texas yield to time on this legislation? I continue to yield as much time as my ranking member consumes. The gentleman from uh, California is now recognized to speak on H.R. 5728. Well, Mr. Speaker, I just want uh, the members to know that I'm going to put a statement in the record supporting this legislation and uh, urging all of our colleagues to do so. And rather than enumerate on the reasons why we all support it, uh, I will uh, yield back the balance of my time if I may have unanimous consent to insert my full Je statement in the record. Without objection, so ordered. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, and the gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I have, I have no further speakers and uh, willing to, to uh, the yield back. Gentleman the gentleman from Texas from is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I have no, no further speakers and, and uh, I yield back my time. So the gentleman Michigan uh, seek additional uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, time. I would yield back the, the balance of my time. All time uh, having expired, the question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill H.R. 5728? Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed.